Hundreds of millions in tax cuts for individuals and businesses, and some cuts that didn't make the cut. Still, a budget that's larger than last year's, but possibly tighter. Tightest possible margin. A yes vote on the Medicaid budget that makes all the pieces fit. A view of the General Assembly in its concluding hours. A view from the House. Coming up on Arkansas Week. Support for Arkansas Week provided by the Arkansas Democrat Gazette, the Arkansas Times, and KUAR-FM 89. Hello again, everyone. Thanks for joining us for Arkansas Week. You can measure more nearly in hours than days the remaining time of the uh, regular session of the 92nd Arkansas General Assembly. So we'll spend the next half hour in a sort of review from the House floor and uh, from the House press gallery anyway. We're joined by Representative Doug House, Republican of North Little Rock, and Representative Reginald Murdoch, Democrat of Mariana. Gentlemen, thanks very much for being with us. Thank you. General Assembly's primary obligation of, is, of course, passing, uh, passing a budget. That's step number one. So we're days, hours maybe away from the Re Revenue Stabilization Act. Mr. House, you have done a lot of tax cutting and still uh, Basically, the budget that Mr. Hutchinson, Governor Hutchinson, proposed to you gentlemen and your colleagues in the Senate is going to escape intact. I think so. The Revenue Stabilization Act draft uh, will be on our desk this morning, they told us yesterday. So we'll be looking and seeing how the budget's going to be allocated. Excuse me, we should know for our audience's benefit that we're taping it mid-morning on Friday. So Right, right. that's true. And uh, so Friday morning we will have the RSA right. draft and we'll be looking it over. and. There'll be some fussing and arguing and negotiating and that sort of thing. But and then you'll pass it. And then we'll probably pass it. <laughs> Mr. Murdoch. Well, absolutely. As uh, Representative House said, that it was scheduled to be on the desk this morning. We'll review it and we'll be some, there'll be some deliberating, some discussions. Some have already started as late as last night in pro possibly doing some amendments to the RSA to satisfy some of the needs and wishes of various members. It always happens, but eventually we'll pass something uh, and get it done. It will be in the neighborhood of a hundred and a quarter, a hundred and fifty million dollars bigger than the 19 budget, the fiscal 19 budget. Nonetheless, there was room, uh, both chambers concurred, in the administration's plan for some pretty significant income tax cuts, uh, well, corporate and personal income tax cuts. That's reductions. True. It's a tight budget by anybody's definition. Uh, are you gentlemen worried that it may be too tight, Mr. Howe? No, I'm not. Uh, not with the report that we had just a couple of days ago that it looks like we're $88 million ahead for this month on collections uh, due largely to corporate income tax collections. Uh, I think that the inflationary factor and, and the fact that I think the governor's economic plan, which is increased jobs, you increase jobs, you increase revenues, I think it's starting to work and I think we can see it working. And the beautiful thing about Arkansas's Revenue Stabilization Act, if you don't have enough money to do something with, you don't get to borrow it. You just don't get to spend it. So uh, I'm comfortable that we'll be where we need to be. Mr. Murdoch. Yeah, I feel comfortable as well uh, as far as the final outcome. Now, some of the inner dealings of what happened with the tax cuts and some of the things that we made adjustments with for the tax cuts, I don't know that um, obviously that debate is over, but we don't necessarily we would, I'd like to see a few things differently happen uh, as we go down that road, but I think at the end of the day it's going to balance, as Representative House said, that it's it's about the law, the Constitution in Arkansas. We have to balance it. And, and can't we deficit can't, spend. We, right, can't deficit spend in Arkansas. Uh, I do, you know, again, as I said, that there were some wishes that we would, would hope to happen differently, some things hopefully in RSA uh, we can fix and make better in terms of some um, areas that we want to make sure we pay well, one, attention to. I'm sorry. One criticism of the administration's approach was that it did not do enough in terms of strategic long-term investment. In terms well, of social services, in terms of governmental services on a broader level. Mr. Murdoch, let's start with you. Well, absolutely. As, as we look long-term at some of the things that's, that's necessary, there were some concerns for that, and they're still there. And, I mean, obviously, when you have 
a philosophical difference as we have in the chamber, uh, in, in the uh, executive branch now, and that yielded to that. So again, we understand that um, we just hope to still be responsible for what happens, the, the, the end outcome of that. Well, certainly, uh, we all have some priorities. I, uh, the Human Development Center, for instance, in Conway is not in my district, but I have a lot of constituents that work there. And the residents there are very dear and near and tender to my heart. So I would love to have had more money going in that direction, and as well as the four other human development centers we have around the state. Um, there are always needs for uh, special, uh, uh, the developmentally disabled people in, in education is always an area. Uh, pardons and paroles, we always want to try to plus that up to try to keep the prison populations down. So yes, we all do have youth our services. Youth services, uh, uh, nurse, not nursing homes, but um, um, our senior citizen centers is another area we would have liked to put more money to. Higher ed, everything, everything. But that's the whole nature of this. There are always more needs than there is money, so you have to make some balances and compromises. Overall, uh, support the governor's budget. It's pretty reasonable. Well, with, with the economy uh, doing as well as it is, some would argue that this is not necessarily the time to raise taxes. Uh, Mr. House, we'll go to, back to you first, and then, this, then to Mr. Murdoch. Well, you know, we are... You had an excellent jobs report nationwide on Friday yeah. morning. There, there is a philosophy behind what taxes we have been cutting and what taxes have gone up. Uh, we want to reward work. Now, that's our corporate philosophy as far as Republicans are concerned. And there's a tendency in our party to see that the, that the people who are using the services pay for the services. And the gas tax is a good example. If you're out there tearing up the roads, you need to be paying for the uh, repair. The trucking industry, for instance, came out strong in favor of a six cent diesel tax increase. Um, the uh, internet sales tax is gonna raise a little bit of money, not as much as people had hoped for because I think eight out of ten largest internet sellers are already remitting the tax without anything. But um, a few dollars here and a few dollars there, trying to balance out and make everything fair and right and even, as much as we know how to do, uh, I'm, I'm comfortable we've done about as best as uh, anybody could in this state. Mr. Murdoch? Well, the major increase, which was for highways, we had to do that. I mean, the highways, as you know, the shape that they're in, so that increase had to happen. And I think that it's uh, the citizens of Arkansas would appreciate that as we drive up and down these roads. It's essential to health care, education, to commerce, to, to um, um, jobs. Uh, that highway had to get done. So that tax increase that was associated with that, that's certainly necessary. I think when you go back and look at, though, the tax cuts, the concerns become philosophically when you cut some of the taxes that we have cut and then also some of the um, uh, the drill down that we have on some of the services, you know, pre-K, after school, uh, some of those essential things to education as we look at new adequacy uh, funding as we go into the biennium. We're going to be concerned that when you say that we don't have the money or, the, or it's so tight as you mentioned earlier, but we've cut so much out of the budget over the last Oh, five, six years, about 500 million roughly out of our budget. And there's so many services out there that need to be tended to. So again, a philosophical differences. Some believe you, you, you cut taxes of the rich to take care of those that need it and they'll create jobs. Uh, that's the trickle down economics that we've heard about for many, many years. Uh, we don't all subscribe to that. So anyway, that's just some of the difference there. And for many years, I gather, you've been skeptical of it. Very skeptical of it. I, I think the rich gets richer in those situations. I think their families become very endowed and their close friends. But I think that how we really do it is by sharing the uh, distribution of, of those dollars and making sure that all is built up. And I think until we do that, we're going to continue to find the disparities that we find in education, health care, and other things across the state. I think it's important when in these good times economically that we take advantage of these good times and we go and we shore up our most toughest and most um, areas that need the most repair. I think it's a blessing that we can do that now, but I don't think we're doing that in the manner that we can. Well, the, the equity argument, Mr. House, was one that, as, as Mr. Murdoch just put, it was echoed by uh, many other members during, or at least in the minority anyway. Democratic minority and some on the Republican side, that equity was being sacrificed overall in this session, particularly vis-a-vis -vis the gasoline tax. Well, you know, it, uh, it it's in the eye to of the beholder. It's, it's, it's in the eye of the beholder, certainly. Uh, 
uh, all I know, here's what I do know, and we've seen the number of employed people go up. We've seen the number of jobs open up in the state go up. Unemployment is way down. Uh, wages are up. Uh, the good things that are happening to the working people across the board. Like I said, our philosophy uh, as a party is that we encourage work. And, um, uh, it, it, of course, I, I, I do and understand uh, Representative Murdoch's concerns, but we did that for 138 years with education, and it got no better. And we're doing things differently now, and we think over time that we will see some improvement. And I think we are beginning to see improvement in all of those things economy, education, health care. Um, I think as time goes by, we're going to see a different philosophy work better than what has been going on before. Well, you said 138 years, but for 138 years, we really didn't have that much of a commitment, which got us into the, into the Lakeview case, though, did it not? It Is did, that? it did, and we wound up with the Pulaski County desegregation case, putting over a billion dollars into the Pulaski County school districts. Little Rock still under supervision, North Little Rock, Jacksonville North, and uh, Pulaski County Special. Um, well, set aside Pulaski, though, but, but the rest of the state as well. Well, right? certainly the rest of the state. It, uh, we have other schools that are now under state supervision. Um, but things are moving. Uh, if they're not, uh, that's part of the things that were passed a couple of years ago, that it, if a district's not being run properly, the state's going to step in. We have a constitutional obligation for the state to step in when it's not working right. So things are happening differently, and we hope long haul it'll be an improvement. If, if I may, Steve, uh, and, 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 we, and that's a great point that you make about where we are. And uh, I had a visit with the governor just a couple of days ago, and we were talking about the assessment of education in the state of Arkansas and the capacity of the state as we uh, go in and sometimes take over districts and what's left and what do we do with them over a period of time. If we look at that test, and I don't think that the state of Arkansas the Department of Education is interested in taking over districts. I don't think that's what they're interested in, but I think that the problem has not been solved. And I go back to the point I made about in these good economic times, when we have some space and time to possibly go in and really evaluate the situation. Where I think the problem is, is throughout the years, the assessments that have been done by Olden Pikers and others since we went to the Lake, since the Lakeview case, we have not taken their recommendations and done them as stated. We have taken and partially funded. If if Olden Pikers has told us, who was the actuary who did the assessment, if they tell us that we needed to fund things and, and create uh, opportunities to a certain level and we do it to 50 to 60 percent of that number, then we are we shouldn't expect a hundred percent return. So we have not given the investment that has been even we paid for as an assessment to do specifically in education. But, but you know, uh, I, I contacted um, Senator Johnny Key, the Commissioner of Education, uh, just a few days ago, and I and asked him how much money were we putting in education? Uh, about two billion state, and overall about another two billion in federal. Four billion dollars coming from the state coffers, either from the feds or state taxpayers, to the school districts. So uh, uh, what, Reg what uh, Senator Reg Rep Representative Murdoch says is absolutely correct, and to paraphrase uh, Winston Churchill's remark about Americans, Arkansans will always do the right thing after they've tried everything else, so we'll keep on going. Well, uh, uh, back to tax equity for just a second. It came from what you, from your uh, it came late in the session, and but from your one of your Republican counterparts in the Senate, uh, Mr. Hendren, the Majority Leader, uh, or the Pro Tem, excuse me, uh, and that was an EITC, but it just didn't get any traction. Absolutely, yeah. That that started out real good, but real. I mean, you know, two, three, four sessions now that it's been yeah now, raised. Right now, the the, the way that uh, Senator Hendren brought that, and though you know we. As Democrats, we bought into that. We, 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 we thought it would be initially something to balance. Now, of course, that tax would have been on, uh, re to some degree, a regressive tax because it would have been on the backs of some of the, those smokers and those that eat cigarettes, the vapor. So that's where it was going to be funded from, but it didn't get any traction because of that. And then when it, uh, Senator Hendren looked to amend the bill, he was going to amend it in a manner that, that the income tax credit was going to be basically gone out of it. So that's why we ended up amending off of the bill. Um, and I haven't even heard from it since then. Uh, last I heard that uh, it, we could re achieve the same result by just imposing no tax on anybody earning 22000 or less and achieve the same result as an earned income tax credit, which would have been, if I recall correctly, 10% of what the federal return would have been. 
if, if my memory serves me. So uh, uh, in my party, earned income tax credit uh, is not favored anymore when it exceeds the amount of taxes paid into the system. <clears throat> Everybody in our, our party has kind of favored having an EITC as long as it, the return on the money did not exceed the amount of taxes paid in which basically means no taxes on a certain amount of income. It would have been minimal, I believe, yeah. it, it would have been minimal. in those yeah. cases. And, and if the concept is incentivizing work, and if you're trying to incentivize those that are the working poor, what the EITC typically helps are those that are lower wage earners, but they are working. And if you truly, as uh, my uh, colleagues, Republican colleagues, say that they incentivize work and believe in work, and we do too as Democrats, but sometimes you need to incentivize both ends. And again, as I said, uh, this is an opportunity in these good economic times to reach down and maybe where it's not totally a balanced, profitable, if you will, thing to still help those that are working and incentivize them with the EITC. I which, think it's a perfect which opportunity. Is, which is a good, and, and this discussion is a good example. We all have the same goals. We just have different ways to try to get there. <laughs> well, now one more question on, on the fiscal outlook anyway, and it was, I believe, Senator Dismang, uh, a good Republican over on the Senate side, and several other individuals, some Republicans, some Democrats, are frankly uh, a little antsy about the economy later in this year. I think Mr. Dismang cited the four, he's got uh, this, this ominous feeling about the fourth quarter. Well, uh, that has been something that... The red-hot economy may cool significantly. Yeah, we're running about uh, three, three and a half percent mm -hmm. this quarter, I think. Most economists nationwide say we're going to uh, tone it down probably in the neighborhood of two. Sustainability of, of, of an economy kind of kind of evens out around 2% according to what I read in, in the national papers and, and the econ economic journals. So um, yeah, it's, it's a distinct possibility things can cool off. Um, there is always the chance for, of a reception. Uh, I've been studying that for three years with, in terms of the retirement systems. What, what are we going to do when the stock market finally takes a nosedive? Uh, so it, the concern is valid. Uh, it will just mean that uh, we may not be able to expand as fast as we'd like to. But I think we'll, still re we'll certainly remain solvent through this with, uh, with the state budget. Let me move on if I can. Uh, it took 27 in the Senate, and they got it. And a couple of hours later, a U.S. District Judge in Washington said, kick the work, Carmina. On your gentleman's side of the House, it just took one stumble, if you want to call it that. It took just two votes to get that Medicaid appropriation through. Uh, surprised? Not at all. Not at all. Uh, you know, uh, there's probably, when it comes to Medicaid expansion, there are three camps in the Republican Party. There are conservative but pra pragmatic uh, Republicans, and the governor is one of those. There are, I would call them the Northwest Arkansas that are highly pro-business, and then there are the Tea Party Republicans, very libertarian-minded folks. So you'll find some division of opinion among those. But uh, for me and my district, I have 5,000 people that work in the healthcare industry, 5,000 families certainly, that work in the healthcare industry. And I heard uh, Senator Brian King say one day, you know, when we have a difficult case where they can't pay their way, we send them to Little Rock. Those are my people taking care of those people that don't have insurance. So that makes my position real clear. I want my constituents paid. So that's my position. <laughs> Mr. Murdoch. Oh, well, you know, we love it. We, we, we uh, Medicaid expansion, uh, I was a part of the original uh, private option way back when it went, when this first started it with under Governor Beebe and the way it was structured, it was structured whereby the budget that you currently live under now and you um, uh, praise to some degree. It was it was based a large part upon that uh, Medicaid, the form of Medicaid expansion that we did, along with some very astute uh, Republican friends of mine that uh, to create the private option. But today, I mean, we're, we're as happy about it as we were then. We thought it would get passed. We know it needs to be. It has to happen for our current budget. It has to happen. Mr. Hutchinson, Governor Hutchinson, and I'm again quoting Mr. Hendren, uh, Senator Hendren over on the Senate side, have indicated, said over recent months, years, whether anyone likes the private, or now Arkansas works, works or not, it is seemingly just woven into the fabric of government, fiscal governance 
of, of Arkansas. Certainly, so, certainly it is. There's no turning back, basically, is what, unless something better comes along. It, it would take a better idea. Uh, it, if you go back at the time that we did the private option, um, the federal government had basically raided the Medicare and Medicaid and other payment accounts at the hospitals. And what was happening is uh, people that could pay were paying $10 for an aspirin, the old, as the old story goes, or uh, people that could pay or had insurance were being overcharged in order to cover the cost of the poor. And that's the way it was done. And then when the federal government pulled back all of the extra money and said we're only going to pay certain amounts uh, in order to fund or help fund uh, the Affordable Care Act, a.k.a. Obamacare, that didn't leave us much choice. So, um, yes, it is part of the fabric. And until somebody comes up with a better idea, that's what we've got, and we're going to have to live within the federal parameters. It looks as though the legislature, well, it will. The legislature will refer to the people a, uh, a, a constitutional amendment regarding access to the ballot by initiatives and refer referenda, other constitutional amendments. There was a division over that. Mr. House, I'll let you start. Well, uh, there were a couple of bills that went through. We passed uh, one, um, uh, Representative Dean Vaught's bill. Uh, what's going on is big money's coming in and buying the signatures, buying the process. And so you see two things that have happened. One, you've got uh, companies enshrined into our Constitution with monopolies. That can't be good government, and we're asking the people to take a look at it. And uh, the other thing is, um, uh, well, I, we'll just leave it at that, and that's the, the evil we're trying to avoid. Well, is the cure worse, though, than the ailment? Mr. Murdoch College. Yeah, so, yeah, the other side of that is... It, it, I'll how, get another issue in if I... It's how hard it makes it for uh, the average person to be able to participate in that process and getting something on the ballot that they see change. So, it, again, it's, it, which side, how you look at it is either glass half empty or half full. It depends on how you how you look at it. So, we think that it just, it, you know, some think that it just makes it tougher for you to be able to participate in the process. What uh, my colleagues on the other side says is protecting the integrity of it uh, to some degree. Uh, so. and, and, and the most conservative of, of, of my party are, are saying, you missed the target. Uh, the, the bill that we are referring to the people, that the rich companies are going to be able to step right over it and have no problem at all meeting those requirements. Getting signatures in every county, uh, uh, paying the canvassers, making sure they're all qualified, and, and hitting all the legal hurdles, the big companies with the money, That's right. they're not going to have any trouble. And one final issue I would ask you gentlemen to address, and that's the matter of school vouchers, two major pieces of legislation. Neither uh, appears likely to, well, one is dead, certainly, and the other is on life support. Worse, life support. Right? Absolutely. The, the, the Senate Bill 539, which came through the Education Committee yesterday and died in the committee, it's, you know, it, it was explained that what the ideal is for 400 people to be able to, out of 480,000, which is less than 1% of the population, the school population, to utilize it. I, I understand the, the goal, I think, and I met with the governor on this, on what they're trying to do to impact our education in Arkansas. They're making efforts, but I just think there's a better way and a different way, and that way includes collaboration, specifically collaboration, bring to the table those that are sharing in the, that represent those districts that, that are suffering the most. Many times you have people uh, to look out for you or, 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 or be uh, trying to help you, but when you're not invited to the table, you're not a part of the process, they omit you sometimes. So I've encouraged as we go forward, because the voucher bill is just not the answer, it's more exclusionary and it does not help in any way. It right. does not help. And you consider the fact that a lot of Republicans oppose the vouchers. Now why is that? These are rural Republicans and I can start naming towns as you go up either interstate that are very, very happy with their public schools. And they don't want vouchers in their public schools because they've got the schools the way they want them. Now, here, here in Pulaski County, we've got some troubled schools with, with troubled students and, and problems to solve. And in other places around the state, there are areas where there are problems to solve. But it's kind of hard when you're legislating for the entire state to focus on your real uh, problems in certain areas. You can't really single one out, and that's a very difficult thing to do under our present Constitution. Well, that's the administration's bill that you're referring to. That's that's correct, and um, so it, it's, a, it's a challenge. 
basically, uh, my personal feeling is is that all of the choices ought to be on the table, uh, whether it's private school, parochial school, public school, mm -hmm. uh, home school, and people that can't afford them have some sort of help, but it's kind of hard to make that apply to three million people, and that's what we have to do. And uh, it's a difficult process. Well, one other add on, on, on the choice, because it's all it's behind the choice concept is what this is. And, and for me and many others, before you can have choice, you have to have equity. The, the playing field needs to be level. Then we make choices. But the way it is now with the playing field so uneven, choice, it becomes easy. It's not truly choice. It's something else. So we have to level the field before we can truly address choice. And I have no choice now but to end it because we're <laughs> simply out of time. Gentlemen, thank you very much for your time. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you. All right. Enjoy your time away from the Capitol, such as it may be. We're counting down the days. All right. Okay. Thank you for joining us as always, and we'll see you next week. Support for Arkansas Week provided by the Arkansas Democrat Gazette, the Arkansas Times, and KUAR-FM 89.